Thank you, everybody. And uh, Kwong, thank you very much. Uh, really do appreciate the invitation to come out and share this information with you all. Uh, I was told to talk for about 45 minutes and then leave some time for questions. Uh, please, if you want, just uh, if you have a question as I'm going along, I don't mind if you throw your hand up. I'm, I'm happy to take questions as we go. We should have time at the end as well, okay? Uh, I do want to thank you for your hospitality. Uh, Kwong, but it, it really didn't have to extend this far. I really appreciate the welcoming committee you, you put out for me today. Uh, this was actually not today. Uh, this was when my daughter moved in two years ago, and they were out there honking their horns and, and making a big deal about everybody showing up on the farm. Um, I don't know what we're doing here, but this is my daughter, Julia, uh, when we were moving in. Uh, happier times. This was the Rose Bowl two years ago, uh, not this past year. Uh, when we decided we better go, Julia was just a freshman, but uh, we fed, they made it to the Rose Bowl, of course, and we figured they may not make it back, we better go. And of course they did make it back, but we got to see the game against uh, Wisconsin, the, the victory. And I had great seats. This was, <laughs> this is me up here. If you look, uh, if you take three rows up and look over the side, I think you can actually see the city of Los Angeles. That's how far away from the field we were. But we had a happy uh, ending to that night. This was the big celebration at the end, of course. So anyway, what we're here to talk about this afternoon, though, is, is this kind of stuff, uh, early glottic cancer, okay? Um, and, and what I want to do is sort of ease into this a little bit because, you know, part of treating uh, T1 and T2 lesions on the vocal fold surface uh, also involves knowing how do you know that you've got a squamous cell carcinoma? How do you know you've got a minimally invasive process? Uh, we've all looked at white lesions on vocal folds, so I'm going to talk a little bit um, about, uh, you know, lesions like this, getting a biopsy, determining what you've got, so then appropriate treatment following that. So we're going to talk a little bit about white lesions in general, and then we're going to ease into stuff that really is cancer. Uh, and I'm going to talk then about the treatment strategy that we sort of have for a lot of this stuff, and that involves the, the use of the KTP laser uh, to uh, sort of ablate this disease as opposed to resecting it. Uh, it's basically a narrow margin technique. Uh, and we're going to talk about our experience of how we manage patients both in the uh, operating room and in the office. I'm going to then back up because this is how we got into this a little bit. We had a clinical experience. Anybody who knows Steve Zytels, who I learned all this from, knows that he likes to put himself out there and be somewhat of an innovator. Uh, and we started doing this on some patients uh, that had dysplasia and then moved into a cancer experience. And then we decided to back up and put some science behind it and actually look at an animal model and see what the laser was doing to these. So I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, some data that I had presented earlier. And then I'm just going to present our experience to date. We have a cohort of about 117 patients. We just presented this data uh, at COSM. Uh, and we're going to talk about the oncologic outcomes and the voice outcomes for, for this technique. And then I want to, uh, that will launch me into a little bit about reconstruction. So when you do deal with early vocal fold cancer and you do get glottic defects, talking about reconstructing the glottic valvular function and reestablishing pliability on the vocal fold surface. So if we're dealing with early glottic cancer, T1 and T2 disease, we're talking about survivable disease, right? So then we want to talk about what kind of function we're leaving people with uh, after that. So I'm just going to start with an, a typical example of, of something that we might see. This is a patient who uh, presented to us from an institution across our city who had been treated for one year for fungal laryngitis. Okay. Now, I, I can understand a trial of Diflucan or something, uh, but if it doesn't work, that's not fungus. And one year later, it still wasn't fungus. Uh, this ended up being an, an, a minimally invasive cancer. We use a B designation to indicate that disease comes across the anterior commissure and involves both sides. Um, so you'll see that in, in when I talk about uh, staging today. Here's what this uh, stroboscopy looked like. Okay. You'll see that even with this amount of disease, you've got mobile cords. And there's a degree of stiffness for sure, but you've got some underlying pliability there. So, you know, how do you, how do you go about treating disease here that basically encompasses the entire vibratory surface of the vocal fold, okay? So the first step would be the biopsy. And what we like to do as opposed to uh, sort of a, like a cup biopsy or, or you know, hey, Ed, <laughs> uh, um, is, is more of an excisional biopsy. So we use an infusion of saline technique to lift this lesion. What you're going to see going on here, now this, this video launches a little bit into treatment as well, but the, con the, the point I want to make at this point is just how we do a biopsy. And how do you find a representative uh, a bit of tissue from here, like is the whole thing cancer? Uh, is just this area over here cancer? Uh, you know, how do you know if you've gone deep enough and how do you not go too deep if you also want to preserve vibratory function? 
So this is what you'll see here. Initially, we're just gonna use an infusion needle. This is just saline, uh, and we're, we're trying to gauge the, the depth of injection here. You'll see initially, there's some lift of this lesion. Uh, we don't get a tremendous amount of lift. Ultimately, we do see that the lesion lifts from the underlying layered microstructure. So there's no fixation, at least to the level of the ligament. We're actually not sure yet what this is. We suspect it's cancer, but, and it turns out to be cancer, but other lesions uh, uh, don't have to be this. So here's the, um, the sort of the technique of the excisional biopsy. And we're not taking the whole thing out, you know, as we've come through it here, we're leaving disease behind, but we're gonna take at least a large chunk of representative tissue here that will be full thickness, so it's representative of the disease, uh, and it it's also encompasses a large enough area of epithelium that we're not gonna perhaps miss an area and just call something dysplasia when adjacent to that is CIS or minimally invasive carcinoma. And that's, that's, that's the technique that we sort of universally use. Now that was an extreme example because that patient basically had field cancerization of the entire vocal fold. If smaller lesions don't necessarily lend themselves to as big a removal of tissue, but this is an example of someone who was sent to us who had had a biopsy already. Uh, and this is, uh, this is that same infusion technique. And this is what we don't like to do, and this is why. Uh, because this patient only had moderate dysplasia, which by definition means that there should be a preserved layered microstructure underneath that. That's an epithelial disease. And you can see where the chunk of tissue was taken. And I know that they got full thickness and representative because it, it's pretty scarred there and it won't lift. Now there's a little bit of residual disease left here. So when they got their diagnosis, the, the patient was actually sent to us for definitive management of the rest of the disease. But you can see this area here that simply doesn't lift. Uh, so. Um, that's what I don't like to do. And you're always sort of stuck in, in, in that, that quandary of you know, how do you take a representative full thickness le a biopsy without going too far? So anyway, this is advancing on into the, the KTP laser treatment of this region. And because it's already scarred and we've sort of lost the game in that area, I can get fairly aggressive there uh, and at least try to preserve the surrounding area. There was probably minimal disease left in this patient when they finally presented to, to me. And you can see that the area around this will infuse very, very well, but that's, that area right in there just is, is gone. And we do try to avoid that. So back to that first patient, following their treatment, this is what we were able to achieve. Now stop it right there. You'll notice uh, if you catch it right on the tangent in here, there's a little area of epithelial thickening. He's had this, this is just mucus. You'll see it bouncing around, but there is an area of a little epithelial thickening here. This patient over the years has, he's now four and a half years out, basically disease free from his cancer. Uh, every now and then he comes in uh, and we've been treating in the office, this little spot here. Uh, it turns out just two weeks ago he was in my office and he's never had this, but uh, in an area down here near the anterior commissure, he ended up with another little spot of disease. And we just treat those because the KTP is on a fiber. We can blast those away. We don't re-biopsy those. We just get rid of them uh, when we see them. And that's, that's not uncommon management for people with either field cancerization, uh, minimally invasive carcinoma, or even just dysplasia. So I don't want to belabor the point too much. This is the concept schematically. We've had this in the literature before, so you may have seen it. Just the, the idea that you've got a lesion here that will lift uh, or not lift, and you can determine that with the infusion procedure so that when you're looking at a lesion on the surface, uh, you don't know uh, if, if you know, this surface will look pretty much like this surface. Where do you have the depth of that disease? Is, is, it, is it confined to the epithelium? Is it down through the muscle? Because you'd like to tailor, tailor your resection to the, the depth of, of the disease so you can preserve function maximally. And that's kind of what the whole photoangiolytic KTP laser strategy in our hands amounts to. It amounts to doing, just, doing a cancer operation, but just enough of a cancer operation to preserve enough normal structure as well. So I'm just gonna pause for a second, go through a little bit of the, the basic science behind this, which is where we used a, a hamster cheek pouch model to generate can, uh, uh, mucosal cancer, squamous cell carcinoma, and then see what the effect of just using the KTP laser as an angiolytic laser, not an ablator, but just applying KTP laser energy to it, uh, would the selectivity of the vasculature within a tumor allow for its selective ablation? Um, so we wanted to, to know, did the KTP laser photoangiolysis effectively treat squamous cell carcinoma? We assumed that it would uh, because this was our clinical experience. That was our hypothesis. So we took uh, Syrian male hamsters. This is an, uh, uh, an everted 
cheek pouch from a hamster, and you can apply a carcinogen and develop cancers in them. And then the uh, animals would undergo five weekly photoangiolytic treatments. Uh, we use the pulse KTP laser. This is a relatively low power setting, so 30 watts, 15 millisecond, two pulses per second, relatively low. We fixed the fiber to tissue distance, about two millimeters. We did not use a contact mode. Uh, we did not treat the animal if there was no lesion, and our endpoint was just the characteristic white blanching. If you've got a vascular lesion and you hit it with a KTP laser, you do see a characteristic white blanching of disease. And we stopped at that point. So it was somewhat subjective, but most animals got about the same amount of treatment. And then the hamsters were sacrificed at six weeks and the cheek pouch was analyzed histologically. And what we found was, was pretty interesting, and that was that, that we broke, the data broke down a little bit differently, that lesions less than two millimeters, something like this, uh, one, 10 out of 10 of those lesions resolved after three treatments. Uh, we gave the, the animal f up to five, but after three, uh, that was enough. Uh, and and this, they would end up uh, looking a lot like this with minimal scarring, uh, this degree of uh, sort of scarring as opposed to the normal. Lesions that were larger than that, so sometimes you get them, they look a little more like this. They're a little more exophytic. About the best we could sometimes do was, was get them to look like that, but that was still cancer. So they would shrink, but they would not involute, and it was still cancer. Two out of, only two out of six actually resolved after five treatments, and you would end up with acanthosis and very different looking things at the end. How, how, uh, what time was One week, one week, yeah. Um, and then sometimes, you know, some of these hamsters developed, three of them developed massive tumors, uh, and none, if, if it was larger than that, they simply did not resolve, uh, um, and, and the angiolytic laser alone simply did not work, and in fact, uh, one grew into a bad-looking sarcoma that seemed to take off and, and eventually was taking the hamster's life at the, at the time we sacrificed it anyway. So based on that, we felt that the, uh, the KTP laser angiol angiolysis can be effective to involute malignant hamster cheek pouch lesions that were less than two millimeters in size, okay? Uh, but that malignant ham uh, lesions that were greater than two millimeter in size were, were less effectively treated. Um, and so ultimately our hypothesis was not proven, but the, con the testing conditions were a little different. That's not how we treat patients clinically, what we did with the hamsters. We actually ablate the tumor. We don't just stop when we get the characteristic white blanching. You'll see in a second when I run you through an example of how we treat a larger cancer. Um, we, don't, we don't actually just stop at that point, and we don't treat people a little bit, and then a week later, a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. So it wasn't exactly uh, uh, the, the clinical situation. So this is um, an example of someone actually having the treatment done. Uh, it's a larger tumor. Uh, a little deeper tumor than the one I showed you before. There's already been a biopsy here. Uh, we didn't take that full thickness biopsy because uh, uh, there was a large lesion sitting right there that we felt was gonna be representative and so we took that uh, and we got a diagnosis of carcinoma and here's, here's the treatment of that. So again, we're gonna try and start with that infusion. You'll notice that once we've made an incision in this area, we get a lot of leakage of the saline just right out that hole. Um, and here comes the, the fiber with the KTP laser. This is typical setting, was a little higher, 525 to 600, sometimes 675 millijoules. And we just ablate down through the epithelium until we're full thickness through. We'll infuse again, you can see there's, some, uh, there's also been some treatment over here in the interval. And then the follow-up for these patients, once they heal, includes office-based laser when needed. I alluded to this already with the patient who had the small white lesion that came back. Uh, because the, the KTP comes on a fiber delivery system, so you can put it through a flexible scope. And this is that patient coming back for, for follow-up. Uh, and she has uh, a small area here and a small area out here in the ventricle. And so this is a typical office-based laser. So patient's awake, topically anesthetized. Far less precision with the office-based technique because uh, you have a moving target, essentially. Uh, less control over the fiber to tissue distance, a lot more contact, a lot more trauma to the tissue. This actually heals up 
better than you would imagine, and she tolerates this better than you might imagine. And, and you know, there's certain areas there that, that was sort of tricky. You could, it's hard to get those lesions that are more on a tangent, and it can be hard to get those lesions that are way out into the ventricle. And so we don't, by default, just bring everybody back to the uh, office and treat them there. If we feel like we can't get to a lesion, we take them back to the operating room. So it's not so important where you treat a patient as to how thoroughly you treat them. So this patient, original disease looked like that, and then after several, the initial operating room treatment and several of those office procedures that you saw me just do, we get this. And, and it's not so much, this is, she's a school teacher, and through treatment, she was able to continue to work and teach uh, and have a productive, useful voice. And it's not so much what we don't see there, which of course is very important, but it's what we do see there. Now, there's a degree of stiffness on the medial edge there, but she's got a serviceable voice, she's got a usable voice, and there is some preservation of the pliability with good valvular function with, with a complete glottic closure pattern uh, during phonation. So this is an example of just some of the bigger, thicker lesions. Here, it's a T2 based on its extension uh, up uh, into the ventricle and up onto the superior vestibular fold. You can hear the perturbation in the voice. Here's the surgery for that patient. So initially, and the KTP laser will do this, you can just put it on a continuous mode and it, and it will cut, just like a CO2 laser will cut. And we're doing a vestibulectomy here just to unroof the ventricle and see the lateral extent of the tumor down here on the glottis. So that's all we've really done there. And you can do that with the KTP. I like to, we, use a, we have a thulium laser, which is our equivalent of a CO2 laser. I like to use that laser instead. Then moving along a little further here, so we've already done the vestibulectomy, we've gotten through the cancer, and we basically just ablate through it, and we systematically go around, almost like a Mohs technique, except without the histologic evaluation every step of the way. And you can identify, even at the anterior commissure, where you've gotten through uh, uh, diseased tissue, and when you're down to either fibrous tissue along the tendon of the anterior commissure, or the linear striations of muscle. Where I struggle a little bit is when the tumors are right at the depth of the ligament, because you can't always tell the difference between tumor and ligament, at least not in my mind. So I will readily go right through the ligament till I see muscle. Then I know I'm through it and I'm into healthy tissue. And that's typically, that's, that's basically the technique. And this is how this patient ended up. So you remember how perturbated they were to begin with. And again, you've got some degree of stiffness here, right here. But you've got good glottic closure, you've got, you've got preservation of the, of the mobility and, and good pliability, really, so that you allow the, good, the better vocal fold, uh, the right vocal fold, to vibrate against it. Yeah, that didn't turn out too darn good. So in essence, I want to sort of just explain to you schematically, maybe anchor this for you in a way that you're perhaps more familiar. Uh, this is from Steiner's textbook, and he talks about his technique, where he'll, he'll take a tumor uh, and, and cut right down the middle of it until he's through it to determine the depth. And then he'll go forward and backward until he's around it. So he's basically doing an excision of that tumor endoscopically. And so and here's, here's what it looks like at that level, okay? So going through there, then he comes around the tumor uh, here and here. What we're doing, instead of coming through the tumor to determine its depth and then cutting around it, we're simply shaving down to it. So it, it's basically the Steiner technique with an ultra-narrow margin. Okay, and the KTP laser is our tool to do that because as we cut down through tumor, it doesn't generate a lot of char, and we can see the cell layers as we're going through, going through, and we know when we're at a particular depth. And as long as you systematically go through and expose the entire cancer and treat the entire cancer, you, you can, you can uh, effectively uh, get rid of the um, disease. So this is some of the data uh, based on our experience of doing this now for about eight years. Uh, patient, first patient, oh, nine years now, I guess. First patient was in 2005. We couldn't come out with a lot of this data until recently because we didn't have five-year follow-up, but we now have a cohort of patients of 117. You'll see that now these, um, these patients uh, had no prior radiation. Uh, they now have a follow-up of 53 months. They're all greater than four years, so uh, the, the publication will have them out as uh, almost five years. Uh, and if they had bilateral disease, they were staged six weeks apart. And you'll notice that they're heavily weighted towards the T1 disease. 80, uh, 82 patients were T1, and only 35 were T2. And the results show that uh, you know, for T1 disease, 96% all but three patients uh, had uh, control, uh, were disease-free uh, with preservation of glottic function. Didn't do as well with the T2s, 
Uh, seven of our 10 failures were from the T2 group, so we did have 10 failures. Those 10 failures all went on to radiation therapy. Five of those 10 were controlled with radiation therapy, uh, but the other five, uh, four of those five went on to a laryngectomy, and the fifth uh, died of metastatic disease uh, before he could get a laryngectomy. So overall, if you look at this, uh, of the 117 patients, all but 10, or 91%, uh, preserved radiation for future use. Uh, so we didn't use the single, the single use modality one time for, uh, uh, for early glottic disease. The voice results were, were basically improved, and, and, and I'm gonna flesh that out in the next couple of slides specifically. Uh, and what we found since we've gone to this is that there are fewer reconstructions that are needed. When we take less tissue, uh, we simply don't end up with the glottic insufficiency that requires uh, a reconstruction. So this is a different cohort of patients. This was published in the annals last year. Uh, it's a cohort of 92 patients. Well, we started with 136 because we were able to take voice data from patients who hadn't quite got their five-year survival rate. So they weren't part of our, our cancer cohort, but they could be part of the cohort for the voice data. But only 92 of those 136 actually had a complete set of pre- and post-operative data to report. So in terms of the VRQOL, VRQO, uh, the, the voice-related quality of life, uh, that breaks down into uh, you know, a social and a physical component. Um, routinely through Dr. Hillman's lab, we, we typically do the VRQOL as a opposed to a VHI initially. We now have added the VHI, so we're gonna more standardly report that like everyone does, but uh, the, this cohort was heavily weighted towards having the VRQOL instead. Uh, for, the, for that, a larger number is better, and statistically uh, significant was an improvement there. In terms of the acoustic and aerodynamic measures, if, if you look at the uh, measures of perturbation, uh, for the, for under the acoustic, you'll notice that, um, first of all, all of the grouped data was compared to uh, normals. And you'll notice that there was an improvement uh, for both jitter shim and shimmer as well as noise to harmonic ratio. So there was an improvement. But even with the improvement, these numbers here are still outside the normal range. So we don't improve to normal. We just get people better. Uh, another thing to, to notice is, at least for men, uh, if, or for women too, one of the effects of effectively uh, treating cancer this way, and it's probably true for just about any modality you use, is that the uh, fundamental frequency lowers. And it took men from who were just outside of the normal range for fundamental frequency, too high a pitch, to, uh, to within the, the normal range. And that's probably just reflective of the removal of the mass and the degree of stiffness that's associated with the mass of the growth of the cancer and that kind of thing. As far as aerodynamic measures, the subglottic pressure's improved, still not to normal levels. But if you look at this calculated um, uh, value right down here, which is basically the, uh, a measurement of the degree of efficiency of the voice, we get a lot closer to normal uh, following treatment like this. And again, it's because we, we have uh, preservation uh, you know, we don't have weak, breathy voices, basically. A preservation of some of the tissue in the paraglottic space that can provide a, gla a glottic valvular closure. I just want to briefly mention the other cohort. We pulled these patients out of that. These are patients who had previously received radiation therapy. We, we reported this data separately. Uh, this was a cohort of 20 patients. Not surprisingly, patients who had failed radiotherapy more heavily weighted towards the T bad T2 disease. Fewer T1s here, a uh, little less follow-up. Uh, we did 80% uh, salvage uh, with a follow-up of 39 months, 16 out of those 20 patients. All four of those recurrences or persistences, I should say, of disease were, were the T2 disease, and two of those patients went on to total laryngectomy as their, as their ultimate salvage. Uh, three, of those, three of the four recurrences ultimately died from their disease uh, out of that cohort. So I'm just gonna uh, um, spend the last little bit of time here talking a little bit about reconstructive efforts uh, because the point I wanted to make about the whole thing with the angiolytic and the, can and the KTP laser is that we don't reconstruct as much. We don't have the need to. But one thing that, that is, is a necessary consequence of treating cancer patients is that they're going to end up stiff from the disease. Uh, and so one of sort of the holy grail would be to reestablish pliability. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the end about some of the things that our group is working on to reestablish pliability in vocal folds that, that, that don't uh, have it. Uh, so if you're talking about defects like this, if someone's got glottic cancer and you end up ablating it, cutting it out with a more formal chordectomy, whatever the, whatever the surgical treatment is, you end up with this, this glottic gap. Sometimes it's just near the front or more of a keyhole aperture. And the three strategies we've sort of devised for this are either to put in an implant, and this is depicting like a Gore-Tex strip, that will push things over. You can inject substances. 
and we, we favor the autologous substances such as fat. Uh, and, or you can do a, uh, or a thyroid uh, cartilage subluxation where you, you push this in. And I'm gonna show you an example of, of how we reconstruct uh, glottic cancer with, with some of those methods. So here's somebody, now these are older cases because this case I'm gonna show you, we actually took a thulium laser and did a more formal chordectomy. So there was more of a glottic gap. Today we might not even do that. We might ablate this, this lesion with a narrower margin and maybe not need to reconstruct. But what you'll see here, this was this patient's, it's a T1A preoperative exam. Low pitch e. You see the basic normal vibration of the right vocal cord and the extreme stiffness over here in the growth. And here's the thulium laser. So this is not like a KTP. This is more like a, like a CO2, like what would come on an OmniGuide fiber or something like that. You're simply just cutting. And we like it because it comes on a fiber so we can cut three-dimensionally and tangentially and things like that. But it's nothing more than that. This is just a chordectomy. And we're cutting in the paraglottic space um, to get around this tumor. And you'll see it come out here in a second. But uh, you know, this is a, a resection, and a, sort of an on-block resection that's going to leave a gap here. And the bleeding came from a, 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 a margin uh, biopsy that was taken just to determine that we were deep enough at that time. And this is what this uh, patient uh, uh, ended up with. And so uh, this is pre, they ultimately needed reconstruction, and we did a lipo injection for that. Uh, and this is what they were like pre-lipo injection. So this is that patient's, essentially this patient's post-operative result. You see the stiffness and the, and the gap. And then uh, after a lipo injection, I think he actually had two lipo injections. A little bit better, still the degree of stiffness, a little bit better glottic closure. Uh, much happier with his voice, so he was certainly less breathy with that, and so that was our strategy to reconstruct him. That's typically what I'll, I'll do if there's somebody who's missing a lot of tissue in the paraglottic space or a lot of the cord is actually gone. My first move will be fat. It's autologous. It, sometimes then you build that up and you can put an implant in behind it and then you're less apt to have the implant extrude, especially in a radiation failure. These are mostly the patients that we're doing bigger resections on anyway, uh, and so we don't want to necessarily put a foreign body in a radiated field. Yes, question? The fat that, that lives lasts indefinitely. Um, as you probably are well aware, you lose about 50 to 60% of what you inject right off the bat. So we over-inject, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the actual procedure of lipo injection uh, in a second, but that's another reason I like it, and this is what I tell my patients, is that once the fat's there and established, it's, it's there. Um, so it doesn't go away like radius or, uh, or, or uh, Restylin or some of the other um, you know, temporary gel-like substances, so it would be more permanent. So this is essentially what this, what this patient had done. You see a, the, a glottic defect there. Uh, here's a needle from a Bruning syringe coming in and injecting fat into the paraglottic space. You see it kind of coming out the needle hole here, and here it is at higher power, and, and it's been plumped up uh, in that area where there's more of a defect, and that, that's basically it. Um, uh, those in the room that do this know that there are a lot of technical um, uh, problems with this sometimes. Um, this was my project during fellowship, so I had to throw it into this talk because I never get a chance to present this. And you know, it's been nine years, and I never get to talk about this. And I, I spent a lot of time doing it. But anyway, we we did a, a little study just to look at practical ways around some of the issues related to this injection. The Bruning's injector is a very common injector. It's good for fat because it works. It's basically a small caulking gun. And you know you get the fat going, and you can't really control it through other means. But the clicking gets you, and sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll click and you get nothing, and you click and you get nothing, then you click and you get, you know, the whole thing goes squirting out of there. So uh, there's that issue. Fat can be a little tricky to work with. We have since gone to a harvesting technique where we use a liposuction catheter. We don't do any other kind of uh, processing on the back table. But ever since we went to that, we don't have all that fibrous tissue associated with it. We take it right out of the syringe. We, we run it through a 19-gauge angiocath right into the back of the Bruning syringe and then inject it, and we don't get any of that uh, uh, problems. But, but you know, the working distance, because of the way the caulking mechanism comes out the back, it can hit the microscope, and, and your visualization through here can be difficult. So, you know, one of the things that we like is we use the, uh, Steve developed the scope. It's got these side ports, so you can bring your instruments in at more of an angle. Things like a Dito and Yako scope uh, are more tubular up to this point here, and, and so when you bring the instruments in like this, they, they, um, they're more in your way. So that's one thing that we like. 
Um, so that allows us to sort of offset the injector so it no longer hits the microscope. If you use a micro manipulator, you, you, can, you can fling that out of the way so it's not in the way, and that gives you a little more working room. You can set your working distance a little bit further away as well. We also bend the needle shaft on these things. You can't do that too many times or they break right off, but you can bend them a little bit if you're careful. And so if you offset the microscope and you come in from the angle, from the side, you can get that binocular visualization and get a pretty accurate, precise fat injection for where you want to place that, even through a large bore needle. Uh, There's another patient I want to present to you who underwent resection of this tumor here. And again, it was at a time where we were doing much more of a resection here, and this was still an endoscopic procedure, it wasn't an open procedure, but he ends up with a much bigger defect, and I just want you to listen to the progression of his voice. So he starts off like this. I just started losing my voice, um, no reason I, I know of, well now I know what it is, but I have no pain. Okay, and this is what his strobe was before we did anything, this is his lesion. Mm. Okay, so post-resection, he ends up with this. Good, again. And you'll recognize Glenn's voice, right? <laughs> Good, again. Good, again. So he's got a fairly large and very anterior uh, defect there. And it's hard uh, because when you, when you cut out tumors that are that anterior, you end up with epithelium right on cartilage or right on tendon. It's hard to get fat to go there. It's hard to get anything to fill that, okay? So this is what he sounded like post-op. And you remember his voice pre-op. He no longer has cancer. It seems to be a lot shorter when I try to talk. I get tired of it and I get dizzy sometimes when I talk too much. So very breathy. Uh, certainly somebody who needs reconstruction. And if you know, remember from the diagram before, he actually had a series of things. We, we put some fat in first, and then he actually underwent this subluxation procedure. Um, again, because it's just hard to get anything to inject into that area. There just isn't a space to do it. And so one, one good strategy is just to let that fold right in. And you just simply make a, uh, a longitudinal cut uh, straight through top to bottom, push it in. You can just take a proline suture, one or two sutures, and go right through the cartilage, and it'll hold it. Uh, and that's what will keep that in there. So this is what he looks like post-reconstruction. Right there. You can still see there's a bit of a defect down there, but he's doing much better. Good again. A little bulge here from the fat, where the fat, some of the fat ended up. I've never been able to really get anything to inject down in that when you have a problem there. It'll all go right here, and if you don't need it there, you're kind of, you haven't helped yourself much. So this is what he ultimately sounds like. I have a voice now. What do you think of your voice? I think it's very good. Good. Back at the Bruin, Bruins games, yelling and screaming, yeah? I wouldn't go that far. The Bruins were still supposed to be in the Stanley Cup at this point. It was going to be perfect, but they're not, so we'll just have to forget about the rest of this. Yeah. So, um... You remember the, a couple of examples I gave you. You know, we, I think that in terms of considering reconstruction uh, of, these, of these patients, there, there's two aspects to it. You'd like to improve the valvular function. You want to get the closure as best as possible. But there's also a degree of stiffness there. So the holy grail, like I mentioned before, is to take people who are, uh, you know, we can, we can get the gap perhaps to be better closed or completely closed, but you can't necessarily reestablish the, the stiffness easily. Um, but one strategy for that, which we're working on in our research lab, is to try and develop a gel that you can inject in there and basically reestablish pliability. So, you know, and what we're, what we're trying to then do is create an area that would, would mimic the superficial lamina propria subepithelially. So we're not talking about the deep injections that would go there, but we're talking about stuff that goes, goes right in there in that area here. So there's two movies. They're very brief movies that, that just feature some of the research that uh, these are from um, some of the postdocs in our lab that are working on the research through MIT for us. And it, it's a little bit self-explanatory, but what, what it is is a, the gel that we're hoping to come along with so that if we can reestablish glottic closure, we can also then come through and, and reestablish pliability and get some vibration. This is James, James Heaton's voice. He's one of our postdocs. We chose PEG because it is used in many FDA-approved products on the market. There are three components of vocal cord biology. PEG, PEG-type which is basically PEG with sticky ends. 
and the photoinitiator, which is a catalyst for the reaction. These three components are mixed in a predetermined ratio, and the gel is formed by shining ultraviolet light on the mixture as shown here. During gelation, the UV light activates the photoinitiator, which in turn activates the sticky ends of the PEG diacrylate. These sticky ends then form a network by attaching to one another. The gelation is complete in about 10 minutes. After incubation and saline for 24 hours, the gel is not only soft but also highly elastic and can be filled into a syringe and injected through a standard hypodermic needle. And then the trick is that this stuff has got to basically be so liquid that it'll vibrate 150 to 200 times per second, but not go away. Like saline will do that. Saline's like a liquid. It's the ultimate liquid, right? But it's not solid enough. And so that's been the trick. Um, and so what we, this is uh, Randy, another one of our postdocs, who is just going to demonstrate the valve. vibrated by gently blowing air from the lungs through a tube with about the same pressure used during normal conversation. Air blown through the gel causes an oscillation similar to that seen in real vocal folds. The video shown here has been slowed down to show the cycles of vibration. So that's, and, and we've, what we've done now is, is proved that, that we can inject that gel uh, into normal vocal cords and not cause scar. Uh, what, what's hard about that gel is to get it to go into an area that's already scarred. So we're working on ways to create little pockets of epithelial to get some pliability back in there. And, that's, and the gel itself is working its way through the FDA for its approval so we can go into human trials. So that's kind of where we are in terms of our efforts to try and reestablish pliability. We're not kind of going the stem cell route. We're, going to, we're just going to make the gel in the lab kind of a route. Uh, but, but ultimately, if we can get complete cancer resection, uh, good oncologic results from that, and then good valvular function with reestablishment of pliability that we feel like that would be the ultimate sort of holy grail of, of, of voice reconstruction. So um, that's my presentation. Um, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions about any of this. Okay. Yeah. It's one of, yeah. Yeah, there is, of course there are, and we've, we've tried that. I guess the, one of the concerns we've got uh, moving forward, we tried it in, in um, uh, uh, ferret model, actually. It was, we, a small animal model, we tried that, and, and we couldn't control where the streptokinase had its effect. So we, cut, we, scarred, the, uh, we scarred the vocal cord, and we injected, uh, we actually used streptokinase, and it, um, it had an intense reaction in, throughout the entire vocal fold and didn't just have any effect really on the scar. Uh, so it, it was something that we've considered in theory, but um, we're, what we're actually looking at now, and I guess maybe it's because we're so laser-centric, we think of every, the solution to everything as being a, some type of laser, right, uh, is to use a, an, a laser that can selectively create a, uh, a pocket in the subepithelium without damaging the epithelium. Uh, and that's where the current research is. And lasers like that exist. It's a femtometer laser. But it, uh, it's, it's only a bench laser. We can't, we haven't figured out, or it hasn't been brought to the operating room yet where it can actually go down a glottoscope and treat a patient. Uh, but our initial uh, experiments are, are looking at ways to create pockets, but we're, we're just on a bench with it. It's, it's a massive uh, sort of undertaking. But that's exactly how uh, the pulse dye and the KTP laser started as well. And now they come on fibers that can, that can go to awake people in the, in the office. So it's really pretty fascinating. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, Ed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, good question, Ed. I, I hadn't gone through that already. Um, so the case I showed you where I actually did a cordectomy, a case like that, when I'm down into muscle through ligament for sure, I would say easily 50% of my patients get some sort of granuloma or granulation tissue. And we will, uh, if there's no concern for what that is, uh, I just treat it right in the office. I'll hit it with the KTP. That thing sucks up laser energy like you wouldn't believe, and it goes away. Uh, I also try to talk some of my patients into just letting it go away, depending on what, you know. The problem is, is granulomas can sometimes look worse than the original cancer did. <laughs> and then you got a patient, you got to show them, you know, they know what they're looking at, and you, got, you say, don't worry, this lump is okay, and that lump wasn't okay. You know, trust me on that. Um, but um, what we found is when we don't go digging as deep 
past these tumors. So essentially what I'm talking to you about with this technique is a narrow margin ablation procedure. We're not getting as many granulomas. We don't get them, and we don't, so we don't get as much granulation, and we don't have to do as much reconstruction as a result. Those, those are the two things that we've noticed that have sort of changed our practice pattern since we've gone to this technique. And again, you know, to stress again, we're just talking about T1 and T2. I mean, T3 and 4 and, you know, different things require open procedures and, and whatnot. We're, we're limited to just early glottic disease. We're not even talking about superglottis and things like that. But yeah, do, you, do you run into that problem with the granulation? Yeah. Right. Uh huh. Yep. I've done that as well. I have. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, and again, I think we tend to be somewhat laser centric. We we have a laser solutions to a lot of problems, uh, and so we um, you know we look at granulation tissue and we think that's an opportunity to laser something, right? Uh, but really, what I try to do is tell them is tell them not to worry about. It. If I really think it's going to go away, and I've watched these things go away, so I know they go away. And if when you can tell a patient that they'll do that, and then other times I feel like. Um, I, I don't have the precision necessarily in the office with a laser, and what I really don't want to do with a patient is have them get a granuloma, have to go through a second treatment for their granuloma, and then have a granuloma from the treatment. Uh, and so oftentimes I will take them back to the operating room instead just for more precision, and, and I'll just cut it off at the base. And you know, with the thought in mind, maybe inject a little steroid at that point, um, with the thought in mind that I'm not recreating the, the, the same original wound, and then this gives them a chance not to heal that wound in the same way. And of course, you're, control, you're treating reflux and you know, all the other things you can do to prevent that. But I, um, when you have a deep wound that certainly is in the muscle, I, I, I find that I get a lot of these granulomas. Mark, is that your experience too? Yeah. Oh, does he? Yeah. Yeah, how, how long do you think the fibrin glue stays there? One cough, two coughs? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I've talked, yeah, Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, yeah, right, right. <laughs> I see where you're going with this, yeah. Well, certainly in that scenario, if I've already had, if, if someone's had Gore-Tex come through and you're probably, what you're getting at, I mean, is the viability of that cartilage at that point, you know, and, and there really isn't a lot. What you generally have is a lot of good fibrous tissue and generally you can get something that'll push. I mean, what, what, would, what do you do with that in that case? Uh, yeah, at some point, you know, you, if you've got a patient down that road for so long, they're they're not too dissatisfied with their pretty crappy voice. You know, if it, you know, they're they're happy. They've had bad disease, right? Um, so at some point, you do have to say, listen, enough. Just because we could do something doesn't mean we have to. But um, I would be very careful about uh, you know cartilage in in that in that particular scenario that you're talking about. That's had multiple operations potentially, radiation failure. Uh, I have had uh, the one patient that comes to mind. I, I was pulling dead cartilage endoscopically out of him for months and I wasn't sure if it was tumor and every time it wasn't so it was a bad road to go down for a little while and it finally healed and once you get it all the dead cartilage out of there it heals up and he just said listen I'm gonna go with my he actually developed a nice supraglottic sound source and was fine with it that's another thing we're sort of looking at is if they don't if they can't get a glottic sound source maybe you can augment the supraglottis a little bit uh, and turn them more into that and they, they can do they can be very happy with that other than that, I just give them to my speech pathologist and I say, hey, give this person a voice, right? Then, it, then it's on you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Data. Yeah. Well, I'm biased in that in that regard. Um, 
I don't, we don't uh, routinely send patients for radiation. In fact, people seek us out. They've been offered radiation and they've got it, found us on the internet or, or they saw Zytel's on some show or whatever. And, uh, and so they're in and you know, they, they want to hear the other option. And I, I find I've had to sort of come around that a little bit. It's very difficult. I think when you sit down and talk to people about surgery versus radiation, it becomes a no-brainer conversation what someone is going to select. And I really have to slow them down and say, listen, you know, you, you, radiation will cure your cancer. You don't have to do this. This We used to tell them it's experimental. I, we don't say it's experimental anymore uh, because we firmly believe that it works. And I have to say, I, you know, I have to lead with my comments of, you know, you're getting my surgical biased opinion. Of course, this is what I'm going to tell you. Um, I, I like the results and I've done it. I've had it both. I, I came through a system in Virginia where we basically radiated everything. I didn't, we didn't do a lot of surgery on vocal cords for, for minimal disease or, or more advanced disease. Um, and I think the results we're getting are better. I've had patients tell me that they are getting the best voice they've ever had, you know, uh, and they've had, you know, because they've had cancer for a while. They've had gone through the dysplasia state. They haven't had a normal voice, and then they've gotten to the point where they say this is the best voice they've ever had. So I'm glad that the data kind of showed that because subjectively that's kind of what I was thinking already just, you know, dealing with the patients on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, oftentimes um, the patient that comes to mind was my patient. He, he presented to me with what looked like the world's simplest mid-cord T1 lesion, and he was he was 42-year-old non-smoker, and he was dead six months later. And in the meantime, he had a uh, he had undergone his, his laryngectomy and died with with local recurrence in his PM flap and and, and everything. Um, so I would say that the, but the average is, it's, it's not a, it's not a massive delay. We're, we're knowing, you know, when we look at these, if there's disease or not. Uh, and so the, we feel like the, those 10 or those, the five of those 10 and the four that went on to laryngectomy were bad actors with, with bad tumors. And it was readily apparent pretty much immediately. So I would say that, you know, by the time we felt like we were done treating them and they went on to laryngectomy, um, was within three or four months. Uh, yeah, we we do. I mean, it doesn't change our management, which is why we don't buy, we don't take margins. You know, we we this this technique relies on close follow up of the patient too, and they have to understand that they're buying into a technique that relies on them as part of our team. You know, they're not going to do well if they don't come back and follow up. Um, you know, if, if a tumor comes back with, with bad features, I mean, you've got, you know, you're talking about like the gradations of, of dysplasia and whatnot. We, uh, we ablate that disease. You know, the worst disease we treat is, is invasive carcinoma. And we treat that the same way. We just treat it deeper. We go where the, where, where the disease is. So, uh, well, for example, like in the laryngectomy patients, we use um, uh, Histologic features of per perineal invasion, paravascular invasion, as as uh, you know, indicators of bad disease. But those patients have already failed chemo RT. I mean, I haven't done a laryngectomy on anybody who hasn't failed chemo RT since I finished my training. So you know, the the, the histologic features aren't determining subsequent management, um, uh, honestly, for us. No, we haven't had that, not yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We I I get CTs on everybody, even the, the littlest looking T1. And, and I learned my lesson with the with the patient I told you about, who who just had terrible disease. And uh, and, and we so we everyone's got that initial baseline CT, and, and and we really are looking for disease in the neck. Yeah. Oh boy, everyone's hand went up at once. Uh, yeah, back in the back, and then we'll work our way forward. Oh, hi, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. We are now. Uh, Sarah Pay just joined us from, from Johns Hopkins, and this is her clinical interest for, for uh, papilloma and, and this very thing. So uh, now we are. I, six months ago, I would have had to say no, but she just joined us. 
Uh, we were we were not, but there, there's obvious uh, there's you know so, so much in the head and neck world relies on that. I think that's where the answer is going to be. I mean, obviously these tumors don't all behave the same. There's something different about the interaction of a you know a squamous cell in one person versus another genetically, and that's where the answer is going to be. Yeah. What's that? Oh yeah, we because uh, we're just now we're start we're starting this initiative. Yeah, I mean, what are your thoughts, Chris? Well, I'm I'm Yeah. 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 I'll tell you what, Chris, if I can do it, anybody can do it. I'm serious. Uh, Zytel's taught me to do it. Um, and he, he, I, I was not an easy person to teach to do this because I did not, I did not grow up treating cancer like this. Uh, he got so mad, at, he, got, he referred a patient to me who he wanted me to do this to, uh, and I came back and I was asking him how I'm going to reconstruct this guy, and he looked at what I did and he goes, "Well, you did a, he goes, you did a cancer operation, and, and he, he, what I meant for you to do was take the laser and ablate it, and, I, and it, so it's taken me a while to come come along. I, I think what it, for me, what it was." Is developing a comfort level that you're actually um, that you're actually treating cancer, you know, before you worry about the reconstruction and, and that. And so it doesn't, you know, I think it's we've got a comfort level with early glottic disease because we see so much laryngeal disease. I mean, I, I see some people with papilloma that have worse looking disease than, than than what some of these cancers look like. So we just we have a comfort level with it. I think it's your clinical volume that that kind of teaches you that. But the technique's not difficult, Chris. It's not. Well, that was a myth. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Right. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, we we disseminated. We we teach courses. We and you know we have people come by and observe uh, from all over the world. Um, and we we try to put it out there. We publish our results. You know, we use, and and I think that that there is a, a healthy degree of skepticism, uh, as there always is in medicine. I think that there are people that that quickly adapt, and there are people that more slowly adapt. And as has always been the case, things that are valid and actually help patients and deliver good care stand the test of time and those things that are more of a fad and aren't really are more gimmicky or whatever or, or ultimately don't serve our patients the best fall away. Um, for us in our practice pattern, this is not falling away. We're, we're in fact ramping up because, you know, we only presented that cohort of 117 here because that's who we've got five year survival on. That means that that data stopped in 2010. So we've got four years of experience since then. There's a definite learning curve. I would, Steve and I were talking about this before I came out. You know, he feels like he does, he's better at this now than he was when he started. And you, 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 you nuance certain things. But I think that's true of the surgical art. That's what's different about radiation. You don't just open up a textbook, aim your beam, and everyone kind of gets the same thing, whether it's coned in or not coned in or whatnot. I think, you know, I, I kind of tell my patients, you know, cause where they want to go get radiated, I, I kind of feel like, well, you can go close to home and do that, but what's different about where you go across town in Boston or anywhere else, you're, you're, it's, it's, you know, your surgeon who interacts with you one-on-one -on -one is, gonna, is gonna be a difference maker, potentially. You know, determining their level of skill, their level of comfort treating that disease. That's what's different, it's individualized. Surgical care is individualized care, more so than, than anything else. So, yeah, there was a hand over here, I'll get back to you. And then there was somebody over here as well, yeah. Yeah. No. No, it never goes bad. It always goes really well, and everyone tolerates it, and they walk out smiling, and they all sound better. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's, you, it's amazing what people can, can tolerate. I think that actually people do tolerate the lasering better than they tolerate the injections sometimes because we're not touching the tissue necessarily. You saw me touch tissue here. But honestly, you can get people topicalized, pretty numb, and, and to tolerate. If they can tolerate a transnasal scope, they can typically tolerate the lasering. Uh, at least for a period of time. Then what happens is they start to become hypersecretory. You have a window of opportunity to treat for sure. 
Uh, and then as they start to become less tolerant of the procedure, you just gotta cut it off. I'll, I'll do that, like for example, someone who comes in for their first surgery in the office, uh, sometimes I'll stop if I sense that they're getting ready to tip over the edge, because I want them to leave having had a good experience so that they'll come back and get it again. And this is particularly like the papilloma patients and things like that. So uh, the answer, the short answer to your question is yeah, people actually do, do tolerate it, yeah. We can talk, if you had, I want to get to your question too, Sean. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they're not part of this cohort. Couldn't tell you how many. It's, it's uh, you know, you get these transglottic tumors that, that just don't look that bad. And even on the imaging, it, it doesn't look that bad, but it just goes and goes. Next thing you know, you're up in the supraglottis. We'll convert that to an open, sort of a combined endoscopic open. And we oftentimes end up taking the, uh, the you know, the, the cartilage or do it like an open hemi. And then we, we're using a technique where we reconstruct with an aortic homograft. So we're prepared to do that. Um, sometimes we have to just sort of stop and say, listen, this was bigger than we thought. Let me explain to you what we now have to do. And it's going to involve this type of reconstruction because we have to trach those people uh, and, and, then, and then proceed. But that's what we do. And we have had that happen uh, more than once is, is probably the best answer to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's an allograft tissue. It was actually um, the, the aorta, so heavy and elastin, right? And uh, the thora we're in with the thoracic surgeons. I don't know if you all know our, we're, we're, we're in the, we, when we first, when Steve left the INEER and went over to the Mass General, he joined the, the surgery department there. They threw us in with thoracic because they didn't know what else to do with us. So um, what was nice is that we actually adopted a lot of Hermes Grillo's airway practice uh, into our thing. So what they were working on is taking the piece of aorta and reconstructing segments of the trachea with it. And what they were finding is that it didn't work because you always get a cicatricial scar and it just didn't take. But we worked closely with these guys and we started looking at it. We wondered, can the pieces of this aorta that are not tubular be used as a patch? And so we sew it into like a hemilarynx defect and then we, we preserve the straps and we bring the straps down onto the, the uh, uh, the curvature part of the uh, aorta, we get ingrowth of, of cells and, it, and it's viable, uh, it lives. Uh, and it maintains the luminal aspect. So we use it predominantly for uh, large uh, low-grade chondrosarcoma resections. We'll resect up to three quarters of the arch of the cricoid, put a piece of uh, three quarters of a, of a tube of aorta in there, uh, and, it, and it maintains a lumen. Uh, without a stent, uh, trach for about two weeks, then they're, they're swallowing the next day, uh, and no, you know, no donor. You know, it's it's somewhat cost prohibitive, uh, but yeah. So he's not got a second question. I didn't. Right. Make that. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah.